Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. So we are going to do part two today. So if you have not watched part one, I would ask that you would go back and watch that because these teachings build upon one another. So if you want to get the full understanding of the teaching, then you do need to watch them consecutively. <clears throat> So to recap on the first part of the study, we have been looking at the day of the Lord that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24 and how he said that all the things written had to come to pass. We are looking at what a large portion of the church is teaching and that these events have already happened. So if you were a good disciple, you went and read the chapters that I listed in the first video. Um, and you would have a, a, a very clear understanding that there is no way that these things have already happened. And one thing I did forget to mention in the last video concerning the sun, the moon, and the stars not giving their light was the connection to Revelation 8.12, where it said, Then the fourth angel sounded his trumpet, a third of the sun and the moon and the stars were struck. A third of the stars were darkened, a third of the day was without light, and a third of the night as well. So again, just one more confirmation that this has not occurred. So we're going to continue on with what all will occur. And last time we looked at Matthew 24, um, but this time we're going to look at Luke 20, 21 through 22, because it gives us some further things to look for. And you know what? I think that's actually a typo. I think it's supposed to be Luke 21. 20 through 22. <laughs> so I'll fix that before I post the notes. Uh, but it says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart and let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. So what are some of the things that have been written about these days? And we're going to start in Deuteronomy 31, 16 through 18. And it says, and the Lord said to Moses, you will soon rest with your father and these people will rise up and prostitute themselves with foreign gods of the land they are entering. They will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. On that day, my anger will burn against them, and I will abandon them and hide my face from them so that they will be all consumed, and many troubles and afflictions will befall them. On that day, they will say, have not these disasters come upon us because our God is no longer with us? And on that day, I will surely hide my face because of all of the evil they have done by turning to other gods. Moses finishes with verse 21 that says, and when many troubles, which means evil, distress, and misery, and afflictions, which is a rival adversary, adversity, affliction, anguish, distress, tribulation, trouble, and a tight place, when these have come upon them, this song will testify against them because it will not be forgotten from the lips of their descendants. For I know their inclination, even before I bring them into the land that I swore to give them. Verse 29 says, For I know that after my death, you will become utterly corrupt and turn from the path that I have commanded you. And in the days to come, disaster will befall you because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger by the works of your hands. Moses was told to write this song down and to teach it to people because it would be a witness against them. <clears throat> and the definition of tribulation that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24, 21 is pressure. It's used of a narrow place that hymns someone in. Tribulation, especially internal pressure that causes someone to feel confined, restricted, without options, it carries the challenge of coping with an internal pressure of a tribulation, especially when feeling that there is no way of escape. 
2 <clears throat> Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10 says, All this is clear evidence of God's righteous judgment. And so you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering, which is to feel heavy emotion, affected, experience feeling. It's literally a sensed experience. After all, it is only right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict, which is to rub together, constrict, press together, oppressively distress. When circumstances rub us the wrong way that make us feel confined and hemmed in and restricted in a narrow place. And to grant relief to you who are oppressed and to us as well. This will take place when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in blazing fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the penalty of eternal destruction separated from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might on the day that he comes, <clears throat> excuse me, to be glorified in his saints. <coughs> and regarded with wonder by all who have believed, including you who have believed our testimony. So without a doubt, vengeance has not been poured out on those who do not know God because we are still seeing these women dressed in these, the, the most atrocious getups <clears throat> as they protest to for their right to kill their own unborn children. We have letter lifestyles worn as badges of honor instead of shame. Uh, and not to mention the, the congregations of Satan that are masquerading as churches. We can see that from the definitions that both Paul and Jesus were speaking of the same thing. And, and one thing I wanna note here, I know there's a lot of people that got dissension <laughs> about Paul and say that his teaching should be removed from the Bible. And one of the reasons why people would say this is because they simply do not understand the Old Testament. Paul had the greatest understanding of how relevant it is to our understanding of the New Testament. And since the church has mostly set aside the Old Testament, it, it, it's a reason why that Paul's teachings don't make sense to them. So I'm going to read a portion of the Song of Moses. It is from Deuteronomy 32. That is the Song of Moses. I'm going to read 34 through 43. And it says, Have I not stored up these things, sealed them up within my vaults? Vengeance is mine. I will repay. In due time their foot will slip, for their day of disaster is near, and their doom is coming quickly. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their strength is gone and no one remains slave or free. He will say, where are their gods? The rock in which they took refuge, which ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you. Let them give you shelter. See now that I am he. There is no God beside me. I bring death and I give life. I wound and I heal. And there is no one that can deliver from my hand. For I will lift my hand to heaven and declare as surely as I live forever. When I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand grasps it in judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries and repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood while my sword devours flesh, the blood of the slain and the captives, the heads of the enemy leaders. Rejoice, O heavens, with him, and let all God's angels worship him. Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his children. He will take vengeance on his adversaries and repay those who hate him. He will cleanse his land and his people. Now, Revelation 15 talks about those who sing the Song of Moses, and again from Deuteronomy 30, 
uh, too, and I encourage you to go read over the whole Song of Moses, the whole thing, um, because it is sung by those who have victory over the beast, over his name, his number, and his mark. It is those that keep the commandments of God. The Lord said he will have vengeance on those who hate him. And we have some clues from John 14, 15 that says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and remain in his love. 1 John 2, 3 says, By this we can be sure that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Those that hate him are not those who keep his commandments. It's for those that will repent that the Lord will vindicate. Paul wrote about the full number of Gentiles coming in in Romans 11, 25 through 27. And it says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you will not be conceited. A hardening in part has come to Israel until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove godlessness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Godlessness is a lack of respect, showing itself in bold irreverence, refusing to give honor where honor is due. And if your view of this particular scripture is about a certain race, I can assure you that God is not a racist. The covenant of God for his people that is that his laws are written on our heart and then our sins are remembered no more. Hebrews 10, 15 through 17. Also in Jeremiah 32. Could be wrong about that. Sorry, didn't write that one down. But here again, Paul is quoting from Isaiah 59. And I'm going to provide some context from that scripture in which he is quoting. And it's uh, one through four to begin with. <clears throat> it says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. For your hands are stained with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies and your tongue mutters injustice. No one calls for justice. No one pleads his case honestly. They rely on empty pleas. They tell lies. They conceive mischief and give birth to iniquity. Verse 12 through 20 says, For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. Our transgressions are indeed with us, and we know our iniquities. Rebelling, excuse me, and denying the Lord, turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering lies from the heart. So justice is turned away and righteousness stands at a distance for truth is stumbled in the public square and honesty cannot enter in. Truth is missing and whoever turns from evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man. He was amazed that there was no one to intercede. So his own arm brought salvation and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in a cloak of zeal. So he will repay according to their deeds, fury to his enemies, retribution to his foes, and recompense to the islands. So they shall fear the name of the Lord where the sun sets and where his glory rises. For he will come like a raging flood, driven by the breath of the Lord. 
the Redeemer, will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. Moses was given the song so that it stands as a witness, declaring the days of vengeance. Its purpose for some is to turn them from transgression, to cleanse God's people. When all the falsehoods fall, fall <clears throat> it's how we get to the point of have not these disasters come upon us because our God is no longer with us. We find this theme throughout scripture that the people of God corrupt themselves with lies, turning away from truth. So God brings the correction for those that will heed. And we, we see this in Daniel 11, and we're going to absolutely discuss that later. Isaiah 34, 1 through 8 says, Come, Nero nations, to listen. Pay attention, O peoples. Let the earth hear and all that feels fills it the world and all that springs from it. The Lord is angry within all the nations and furious with all of their armies. He will devote them to destruction. He will give them over to slaughter. Their slain will left, be left unburied and the stench of their corpses will rise. The mountains will flow with their blood. All of the stars of heaven will be dissolved. The skies will be rolled up as a scroll and all their stars will fall like withered leaves from the vine like foliage from the fig tree. When my sword has drunk its fill in the heavens, then it will come down upon Edom, upon the people I have devoted to destruction. The sword of the Lord is bathed in blood. It drips with fat, with the blood of the lambs and goats and the fat of kidneys and rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Bo Bozrah, sorry, I'm not probably saying that right, a great, great slaughter in the land of Edom. And the wild oxen will fall with them, the young bulls with the strong ones. Their land will be drenched in blood, for their soil will be soaked with fat. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. So Edom is the line of Esau, which is Genesis 36.1. He is Jacob's brother. And this is going to be so important to understanding the destruction of Jerusalem that we are going to get further and further into as we go along. But the word recompenses in Isaiah is a requital, a retribution, a fee, recompense, reward. And Jesus spoke about this in Revelation 22, 12. And he said, behold, I am coming soon and my reward is with me to give each to give to each one according to what he has done. The word here reward means a reward recompense that appropriately compensates a particular decision and action. This is repeated in Isaiah 40, 10, 62, 11, Jeremiah 17, 10. Romans 2, 6 through 11, and there's a bunch more, but you're going to have to look them up. <clears throat> Isaiah 61, 3 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance to comfort all who mourn, to console the mourners in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and a garment of praise for a spirit of despair. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So we know that the first part of this was done. That's, that's what Jesus said in Luke 4, 18 through 19. But we have not seen the day of God's vengeance. So for all these people that are quoting this particular scripture that he gives the oil of joy for mourning and, you know, the garment of praise for a spirit of despair, you're taking that out of context. So leave the scripture in its context because it is those that mourn 
in Zion, mourning in repentance and, and living by his commandments for what will be done to them. That is who gets the beauty for ashes and the oil of mourning. Isaiah 63, 1 through 6 says, Who is this coming from Edom, from Bozrah with crimson stained garments? Who is this robed in splendor, marching in the greatness of his strength? It is I proclaiming vindication, mighty to save. Why are your clothes red and your garments like the, like one who treads the winepress? I have tread, trodden the winepress alone, and no one from the nations was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my fury. Their blood spattered my garments, and all my clothes were stained. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of my redemption had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one assisted. So my arm brought my brought me salvation, and my own wrath upheld me. I trampled the nations in my anger. In my wrath, I made them drunk and poured out their blood on the ground. And we know that this is talking about Jesus. Revelation 19, 11 through 15 says, Then I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. With righteousness he judges and wages war. He has eyes like a blazing fire and many royal crowns on his head. He has a name written on him that only he himself knows. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in fine linen, white and pure, follow him on white horses and from his mouth proceeds a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Jeremiah 50, 14 through 15 says, Line up in formation around Babylon, all you who draw the bow. Shoot at her, spare no arrows, for she has sinned against the Lord. Raise a war cry against her on every side. She has thrown up her hands and surrenders. Her towers have fallen. Her walls are torn down. Since this is the vengeance of the Lord, take out your vengeance upon her. As she has done, do the same to her. And in 51, 6, it says, flee from Babylon, escape with your lives. Do not be destroyed in her punishment, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will pay her what she deserves. And we see in Revelation 18, 4 about Babylon, the mother of harlots. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins or contract any of her plagues. And verse 6, give back to her as she has done to others. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion in her own cup. Both Matthew and Luke tell us that Jerusalem is going to be surrounded by enemies and fall. And we haven't really begun to get into what that really means, but we're going to in the next video, I hope, unless there's something else that comes up, which just might happen because that's just the way the Lord works. Jeremiah was a man that experienced some of these things, and I say some because we are warned that the tribulation is not like anything that we have seen prior to this time. And in his writing of his experience watching Jerusalem fall, he says in Lamentations 3, 37 and 66, Who has spoken and it came to pass, unless the Lord ordained it? Do not both adversity and good come from the mouth of the Most High? Why should any mortal man complain? in view of his sins. Let us examine and test our ways and turn back to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. We have sinned and rebelled. You have not forgiven. You have covered yourself in anger and pursued us. You have killed without pity. You have covered yourself with a cloud that no prayer can pass through. You have made us scum 
I just realized no prayer can pass through. That's actually, there's a 30 minutes in heaven where the, the cloud of glory fills and no one can go in and out. So, wow. Sorry, some ADD squirrel. <laughs> uh, you have covered yourself with a cloud that no prayer can pass through. You have made us scum and refuse among the nations. All our enemies open their mouths against us. Panic and pitfall have come upon us. Devastation and destruction. Streams of tears flow from my eyes over the destruction of the daughter of my people. My eyes overflow unceasingly without relief until the Lord looks down from heaven and sees. My eyes bring grief to my soul because of the daughters of my city. Without cause, my enemies hunted me like a, like a bird. They dropped me alive into a pit and cast stones upon me. The waters flowed over my head and I thought I was going to die. I called on your name, O Lord, out of the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not ignore my cry for relief. You drew near when I called on you. You said, do not be afraid. You defend my cause, O Lord. You redeem my life. You have seen, O Lord, the wrong done to me. Vindicate my cause. You have seen all their malice and all of their plots against me. O Lord, you have heard their insults, all of their plots against me, the slandering and the murmuring of my assailants against me all day long. When they sit and when they rise, see how they mock me in song. Will you pay them back what they deserve, O Lord, according to the work of their hands? Sorry, this thing is being really screwy to control for some reason. Put a veil of anguish over their hearts. May your curse be upon them. You pursue them in anger and exterminate them from under your heavens, O Lord. We have many witnesses in the Bible of Jerusalem falling, but in not one of them do we find a people, a, a group of people singing the song of Moses. You have Jeremiah singing some sort of version of it, but he is alone. It's, it's not it's not a bunch of people. We have bits and pieces, you know, that, that have come to pass here, but, but it's not the days of vengeance. So some did escape the physical city of Jerusalem when it fell, but that was, again, not the whole of what Moses has said would be fulfilled. So Daniel was another person who saw the, the fall of Jerusalem. And in Daniel 9, 4 through 19, it says, And I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of loving devotion to those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have acted wickedly and rebelled. We have turned away from your commandments and your ordinances. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, leaders, and fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, and all Israel, near and far, in all the countries to which you have driven us because of our unfaithfulness to you. O Lord, we are covered with shame our kings, our leaders, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, even though we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his ways, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey your voice. So the oath and the curse written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have carried out the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under all heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done in Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. 
Yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquities and giving attention to your truth. Let that sink in. Therefore, the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all he does, yet he does, yet we have not obeyed his voice. Now, O Lord our God, you brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, who made yourself a name renowned to this day. We have sinned. We have acted wickedly. O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, I pray your anger and wrath may be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all around us. So now, our, our God, hear the prayers and petition of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, cause your face to shine upon your desolate sanctuary. Incline your ear, O my God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. For we are not presenting our petitions before you because of our righteous acts, but because of your great compassion. O Lord, listen. O Lord, forgive. O Lord. Lost my place. Hear and act. For your sake, O my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. And again, I listed this for several reasons. First, because Daniel saw the destruction of Jerusalem, both he and, and Jeremiah, they're, they're saying the same things. Jerusalem is destroyed for her sin. Rebellion and transgression of God's commands, these things have a consequence. It, it is the curse of the law. And someone's going to say, oh, but we're, we're redeemed from the curse of the law. And to you, I would say that it is those who obey the commands of God that are redeemed. And if you will not hear this truth, you will find out soon enough. It is those like Daniel that will humble themselves, confess the error of their ways, that cry out to God for the abominations committed against him in true repentance, just like the song of Moses says that God is going to honor. And this prayer of Daniel is prophetic in the view of the destruction of Jerusalem to come. It is prophetic of the tribulation and the song of Moses. <clears throat> and we'll discuss that further later. Continuing on with the days of vengeance, Romans 9, 12, 19 says, Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The words were written after telling them to offer their lives as a living sacrifice to the Lord. We are to detest what is evil and cling to what is good, to bless those who persecute us, not repaying evil for evil, considering others before ourselves. By feeding our enemies and giving them a drink to satisfy their, their thirst, we overcome evil with good. And if this is not understood that, that this is the law and the prophets, then there is no understanding of God. The Lord has promised to vindicate those that have done these things, but for those that will not heed, it is a day of recompense. What is being promoted by so many leaders of our faith is the exact opposite of this. It is all about standing up for your rights. It has become perfectly fine to cuss in church, mock, slander those that we view are not in line with our way of thinking, those that harass and treat us wrong. We're going to take over and force our mindset on others. The Constitution has become our God. It is the thing that we hold up as truth. 
political leaders are to be revolted against, unless, of course, they conform to our perspective. And then if they do conform, then we should champion and build them up because they are the strength of us, not God. Our focus has become this world and what it has to offer. It is our idol. We have rejected the truth. It is our hands that are stained with blood and our fingers with iniquity. Our lips have murmured lies and tongues speaks evil, iniquity, and perverseness. We have forgotten that this world is not our home. For those that do not recognize these things, the day of vengeance will be a raging flood. The reward of deeds done in opposition to God. We have sown to the flesh and of the flesh we are going to reap. We absolutely deserve our desolation for our unrepentant attitude and faithful faithlessness to God. Jesus spoke the parable of a widow, one of a desolate house, the unjust judge. It was that parable, the widow and the unjust judge, sorry. The desolate one cries to the judge for vengeance. And Jesus tells us to listen to the words of the unjust judge. Ju I'm tripping over my words now. The unjust judge. He says in Luke 18, 7 through 8, Will not God bring about justice, which means vengeance, for his elect, those are his chosen, who cry out to him day and night? Will he continue to defer their help? I tell you, he will promptly, out care, promptly carry out justice on their behalf. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is for those crying out to him in repentance those that follow him in truth that he will bring justice for. Faith is to be persuaded in your mind and heart about what God says. So will you be among those that he considers of the faith? What side of vengeance are you going to be on? Now, you can reject this message saying it's doom and gloom, but then you have completely missed the whole message. So I pray that you take this to the Father. He will confirm or deny the things that I say. And I hope that you will keep listening because it is going to get very interesting from here on out. But again, I, I wanted to be thorough. I wanted to cover the things, all the things, not just some one event and then try to make a doctrine about it. So anyway, be blessed, brothers and sisters.